Welcome to our roundtable discussion, safeguarding, recognising child-on-child abuse and how to effectively tackle this in international schools. The National College is the leading professional development platform for international schools around the world, helping international schools drive up standards through access to high quality courses and expert-led webinars for all roles. Today, they are sponsoring our discussion about an issue in which they can provide real insight and support, child-on-child -child abuse. Child-on-child -child abuse is the physical, sexual, emotional, and financial abuse and coercive control exercised within young people's relationships, including their intimate relationships, friendships, and wider peer associations. These are all issues that international schools will grapple with. In this discussion, we aim to spotlight the signs and symptoms of child-on-child -child abuse and how schools can take proactive measures to safeguard their students and support their teaching and wider school community with clear policies and procedures. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. Please can we start with a quick round of introductions um, explaining who you are and your current role and where you are today. Uh, Priya, could you start us off, please? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Priya Mitchell and I am a social worker and mental health practitioner from the UK. I've been working internationally for nearly 12 years. Um, working as DSL and counsellor in international schools, uh, both in the Middle East and in the Far East. Um, and I now work as a safeguarding consultant um, and wellbeing consultant uh, to international schools around the world. And Hayley? Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Hayley Wilson. I'm the Deputy Head Pastoral Wellbeing Community at Kellett, the British International School in Hong Kong. I'm also the designated safeguarding lead in the senior school. I've worked in um, Houston, Texas, uh, Cairo and the UK, and I've been in Hong Kong now for three years. I'm really happy to be on the call with you all today. So thanks for inviting me. Thank you. And um, Peter. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Pete Lynch. Uh, I'm a member of the senior leadership team here at Harrow Beijing in, in China. This is my second year here um, and I hold the position of designated safeguarding lead where I'm responsible for, for child protection and safeguarding across our two campuses. Um, before that, uh, I was in Thailand in a similar capacity for over 10 years uh, and my background is kind of the multi-agency working um, and safeguarding from the UK. And I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you. And Jamie. Thanks, Claire. Uh, so my name's Jamie, and I'm Head of International Memberships at the National College. Um, so thanks very much for the introduction at the start, Claire. Um, and ultimately, we are an online streaming platform for professional development for schools all over the world. Um, and I, in my role, I oversee sort of the 550 international school members we have, um, sort of the operations, customer service, future direction of, of content, um, and I mean, what a great panel and delighted to get stuck into the conversation. Great, thank you. OK, we're going to jump straight in. And Hayley, could you lead this question for us? Um, so what are some of the common signs and or symptoms that educators and parents should look out for to recognise child on child abuse amongst their students? I think when we're looking for anything in particular and trying to say that I'm really looking for child on child abuse, you, you can't put it in isolation. Um, so many of the signs and symptoms that you might be looking for in child and child abuse could be leading to multitudes of safeguarding concerns. Um, but whatever it is we're looking for is that child communicating with us. The behaviour that they're showing us is them communicating with us, whether that's um, falling behind in their attendance in school, perhaps changing their friendship groups. They maybe are afraid to go to certain areas. Maybe they've lost weight. Maybe they suddenly don't have their money anymore because somebody's you know coercing them to give them their money are they suddenly nervous and anxious and distressed like these are lots of things that could be indicators of many other safeguarding concerns or mental health concerns but they are things that can indicate child on child abuse and so we need to be digging into that I do think though that one thing to really consider and to look out for with child on child abuse in particular if it's happening within the same year group is an imbalance of power um, and to see has there been a sudden shift that, that wasn't there before? Um, is, is that an imbalance of power that you might observe as well in the corridors between students of different ages? Mm. What's going on with the socioeconomic background of these students? In international schools, we're often um, catering to wealthy families. Mm. Um, 
but equally there are different statuses of socioeconomic background within that we as a school for example have full bursary students from refugee backgrounds mm -hmm. and so it's really important that we're looking into that as well what are these power dynamics in these friendships are they sincere i think that's something to really dig into mm -hmm. where also being very cognizant of the fact that many of the other indicators that teachers are looking out for and are logging could be indicators of child on child abuse mm -hmm. I was going to say, Hayley, that's really interesting when you, you when you were saying that, because I think one of the difficulties when we look on the international scene, as opposed to maybe the UK scene, is the international community setting. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, often in, um, you, you know, when we were back in the UK, it would be your year groups or grade levels. They tend to socialise amongst that same maybe one above or below but the international community is such that it's it's kind of everyone lives in this bit of a bubble um where you know families do get to know each other and you might find that there are friendship groups within different um year groups so when you said that I was like oh actually yes that's a really good point that whereas normally we might kind of go oh that's a bit strange a year seven and a year 11 hanging out together because of international communities, actually, we we sometimes become desensitized to that because we go, oh, yeah, they're, they're family friends, um, you know, because they yeah. all go to the same club or, or whatever. So really good point, yeah, to think about that, that you brought up there. Yeah. I think um, with signs and symptoms as well, you know, and I, I agree with the, the points that are raised here. But I think, you know, what's very important as well, and I think, you know, from, from even from our context, is the relationships and really getting to know, and as a parent, understanding your child or trying to understand your child, but, you know, as, as pastoral staff as well, really getting to know your, your students as individuals. And I think mm -hmm. once that, you know, you solidify that relationship, mm -hmm. I, I always find, you know, particularly, you know, here, you know, when I'm, I'm working with young people, I do notice changes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I, I know when something's the matter. Mm -hmm. You know, I can walk past someone on the corridor, and I think because you know someone well, you just know that something's different and then you know to explore that situation a little bit more I think and then I don't know if it's the same in, in other contexts but I know that that's something that we find quite important here. It, I mean it definitely is and we actually invest a lot of time in cur giving opportunities to cur curate those relationships so that they're mm -hmm. you know there's opportunity for that connection. So, you know, tutors meeting with their tutees one-to-one -one on a regular basis, like touching base and like looking for patterns and trends. We're looking at, you know, all our data collectively to see, okay, is there something again that they're communicating with me that maybe isn't coming through verbally? Yeah. Is it the way they're communicating me with me? They're non-verbal with their attendance, the amount of times they're visiting well-being, have they yeah. been fluenting a lesson, mm -hmm. you know, what what are they telling us absolutely and again they don't just come up pastorally do they as you say it can be in yeah. your classroom you notice that oh that group of friends used to sit next to each other and now they're not mm -hmm. what's yes. happened there and I think it's just being really professionally curious just being curious and logging it mm -hmm. <laughs> so that the safeguarding team <laughs> yeah, got the full the full picture can be passing it to the, the appropriate members of mm -hmm. the school to look into it further so that we are being really proactive with it. Yeah. Yeah. Just, I mean, one question to add on to that, the conversation I've, I've had a few times with, you know, various um, schools, in different countries, but, you know, the, the world's quite a hostile place at the moment between, you know, country and the communities um, yeah. and culturally. Mm. And when you've got pupils in the same classes that, you know, have, uh, you know, from sp specific countries where there might be hostility at the moment. What yeah. are the ways you de of de-escalating that or stopping it from even being a, a factor? Or is there any kind of top tips around that? I think that's a really good point. And, you know, we, we talk about, um, you know, the child on child. And yes, it may be going on in person, but that online, um, excuse the cat, the online presence as well. And this, I was having a conversation with an ICT lead the other day, and we were talking about, you know, where some schools have things like smooth wall, where they're, they're filtering out language. Um, mm -hmm. And it's about really being on top of that, you know, you, you could, you could do kind of a hit list for this week in terms of you know, words that we need to be aware of. And then something happens in the world this weekend 
Mm. And next week, you know, we have to, have to revisit it. So it's kind of not only are we walking down the corridors, uh, like Pete said, and like checking in and, and noticing a child, but also it's it's kind of that whole context, the whole you know environment of a child, and being aware of of suddenly maybe language that's being used by um, young people in our classrooms, and mm. it, you know it, it, we need to be really really aware of how things change and they change so quickly at the moment. Um, and you're right, you know there's so many things going on for for young people, and they're being bombarded with images and messages. Yeah. Um, and it's very easy for them to kind of then start, um, you know, the divides between groups suddenly happening. So, yeah. It's looking at that parallel, isn't it, Priya? To the things that you see and the things that you don't see. Yeah. Sort of thing. What, what we've set up here this year um, as a result of the changes in KC uh, is a filtering and monitoring committee. Because right. I, I wanted to explore the, our filtering system and how we kind of use that properly to integrate it into our safeguarding culture. Um, we use a system called Sankfor, Um, but what we're noticing now is that what we're looking at from an international context is that bilingual filtering, um, because, you know, a lot of these systems are set up to filter uh, English language and the language that we're trying to look out for, for suicide ideation and those sort of things. Mm -hmm. That's all well and good, but now we have other things to contend with, such as the, you know, the AI development mm -hmm. um, in terms of images and that sort of stuff, but also that the language of the, the culture of your country that you're working in. Mm. Uh, so we're trying to explore at the moment as well is looking at the filtering um, of the Chinese language and what we call the pinyin sort of mm -hmm. thing that when students are ty typing those things into, which is, you know, their, their, their mother tongue, mm. you know, yeah. that, that this is being um, flagged up as well, you know, because although I, we, we call ourselves an early health school, but this is an early health indicator, but there's more work that I think that needs to be done globally, I think in that area. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. What an interesting point, um, Peter, to to include that. Yeah, we really do need to consider as well the language that's used, and, and when you are logging this into systems, it's and you're kind of like you said, really reflecting on what's coming through. Then that system, you have to yeah. consider then different language in that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought that was a, a really great point to raise. Um, thank you so much for everybody's um thoughts on this. It was some really good um. And valuable insights in there. Um, Priya, you're going to lead us in our next question. Uh, what policies should schools be looking to develop to successfully address child on child abuse in school settings? I want to come back to what Hayley said about, mm -hmm. um, you know, the child on child, it's, it's part of the bigger safeguarding context. So when we're looking at policies and procedures, I would take that point exactly that you know every school by now should have a safeguarding and child protection policy but it's about making sure that those policies are dovetailed to everything else that's under a safeguarding umbrella so mm -hmm. online uh, safety policy you know our behavior policies um, I also think that we need to be really careful when we look at the language um, that maybe we use around an anti-bullying or our behaviour policies, mm. because often the language that we write our policies in can be quite, um, you know, punishment. You're going to be in trouble if you do A, B and C. So if we're a teenager and you already don't want to kind of snitch or grasp or whatever the, you mm. know, the trendy word is at the moment, if actually you know that something's going on, but you know that ultimately the school is then going to punish the the person who's doing it, then it's another barrier, isn't it, for us to kind of have to get over. So I think, you know, a lot of schools are now looking at restorative practice as a way of um, managing situations, um, especially with things like child on child um, bullying or child on child abuse. So. So I think, you know, I, I would really like to see that schools are thinking about the language of these policies and also how they are um, using the student voice. Um, so when we do have a situation where maybe there is child on child um, unkindness bullying happening, how are we actually using the voice of those people involved, those students that are involved to find the correct consequences? Um, because, it, it, you know, if we say say we've got a child who is the perpetrator of this bullying and then we go down a punishment route, well, actually, there's still a safeguarding route because, like you said, Hayley, communication, you know, behaviour is communication. So what is driving that particular young person to behave in such a way? Mm -hmm. And is 
suspending them the right thing what are they actually learning from that so i think in terms of our policies and procedures we need to make sure that they're all dovetailed in terms of all the safeguarding policies mm -hmm. but looking at language looking at empathy um maybe looking at you know how we're going to manage the situation going forward what are the children learning as opposed to just being punished um mm -hmm. So, yeah. I think, you know, as educators, um, Priya, I think we do need to reflect on those, those kind of sanction, old fashioned sanction policies sort of thing, you know, and, you know, the studies show that actually just, you know, generic sanctions don't actually work because they don't necessarily indicate that the problem's actually solved. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of people would support now with the research in restorative justice and restorative practice um in in terms of you know students sitting down and negotiating and talking through a problem mm -hmm. and looking at the origin of a problem um, and, and that sort of thing we have a um, very similar setup here in terms of restorative practice and we bring in something that we tutors as well called um, cpt conversations mm -hmm. which is a um, close personal tutoring um and that's a, an official kind of thing that's set up and where the tutor will have a, a direct conversation even if the problem or not you know, and we'll have a generic conversation with the students to find out just to check in how they're doing sort of thing. And then all that's recorded as well, but it's transparent too with the pastoral team. So there's kind of a uniformity in the language and kind of understanding of what's going on rather than just like, just setting sanctions and hoping the problem has been solved. Mm. Um, in, in my experience, I don't believe that the, the generic sanctions or detentions solve the bigger picture, I think. I, I It's so good to hear and like, what what you're saying because a lot of it is lining up with what we're doing at Kellett where you know our behavior policy is written in positive language mm -hmm. and we do have sanctions but what we're doing with our sanctions we call them reflections mm -hmm. and um as part of that you know we had a situation quite recently with peer and peer abuse um and what we did was we actually took that situation and he did have an internal exclusion but yeah. he rewrote our positively Kellett curriculum lesson. How can we deliver this differently? What are we not teaching you so that you helping us curate this lesson is going to help other year groups going forward? I think it is important to the students to recognize that what they've done is quite significantly wrong and why it's significantly wrong. And school is a safe place to make mistakes. Let's have this restorative conversation. Let's understand why this is wrong. Let's have this apology together, and then yeah. let's let's move on, right? Um, That's what a great we all, idea. Hmm. Yeah, no, it's 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 really important. And what we also use the uh, an Edinburgh reflection model um, okay. for the student to analyze the situation. Why did this happen? What were the feelings involved? What would I have done differently next time? And they use that to structure, yeah. if you like, a letter to their parents, to their pastoral team, to share their own opinion on, on what happened. And sometimes as well, we'll have them do a presentation to their family on, on that scenario. But I do think we need that difference in escalation of, okay, this is really serious. Um, we, need, we need to highlight that because again, if they were good to go and do some of these mistakes in the real world, there would be very significant consequences. Mm -hmm. But it's just how we phrase that, mm. I think, is is really important. Um, but, you know, just talking about what schools have in policy, you know, you mentioned earlier, um, Priya, what are we doing with the language that students are using? We also capture language from our students to inform our curriculum. So we've noticed there's been things going on with body shaming. Mm -hmm. And so uh, surveys have been given to students um, and they've and sort of anonymously fill that in I've done it as well with year seven for toxic friendships and I've done it with year 11 and year nine in the past when we've been talking about racism and misogyny and people are filling this in and we're showing them this is what you're saying we've even shown parents this is what our children are saying this is what our young people are saying and we've been able to then develop curriculum out of that as well and to go and have dialogue on it and actually year nine in the next couple of weeks they're going to be delving into what they're really passionate about and then to advocate on that issue going forward. We had a speaker come in on body shaming mm. and, and things like that. So they, like their voice is really important. This is important to your year group and it's not policy, but our curriculum is deliberately flexible to respond to what mm. is going on in year groups. So I think that's really important as well under the umbrella of all of, all of it. I really and like you, that parent engagement piece, sorry to, to jump yeah. in. Yeah, and uh, you know, saying that this is what's being said and shared. We're not saying your son or daughter has been saying this. It's yeah. this is the, you know, the overview. 
Mm. I really like it's that. It's really, really powerful. I did that in Cairo and I did it mm. here. When I did it on Cairo, it was in Zoom during COVID times. And initially, like the, the uptake was about 16 parents. And when I put it on the screen, they all got on the parent WhatsApps and then they all <laughs> like, started arriving to the Zoom. And it was really powerful. And they're like, oh my gosh, is this... Is this what my son is experiencing? Is this what my mm. daughter's experiencing? And it helps with empathy. Mm. And, you and know, I, having opportunities to talk about empathy and educate around empathy as well. And it is about those stakeholders. You know, our policies are, are for every stakeholder in the school. So, you know, it's about our parents also understanding um, how, as a school, we're going to address, address these things. And of course, some of it is also dependent um, on, like you said, the seriousness of it and also the legislation. So, you know, if, if we kind of go down the the route of thinking about if there's been some kind of um, inappropriate sexual behavior, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, as a parent, understandably, uh, you're going to want the school to, to come down hard and deal with it. Um, and that's totally understandable. Um, but add to that that if you're in a country, uh, so for instance, if you're in the Middle East, which you know in in Cairo, I'm sure it was quite similar. If you're in the Middle East, things like that can be taken out of your hands as a school very yeah. quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, and then you're left in terms of safeguarding. You're left with, uh, you know, the student who maybe has acted inappropriately, and ultimately you still want to safeguard them because they are teenagers. They don't necessarily act you know having thought things through um so yeah. you're trying to safeguard them you're trying to safeguard you know the young person who has been hurt mm -hmm. and then you've got the parents and you've got the outside external agencies and it can be very very difficult to do and that's why ultimately our policies need to be really comprehensive mm -hmm. um really clear because because that's what can then guide us as a school in terms of what we can and can't do and you know, there is no generic policy, is there, across the world? Because a lot of it yeah. is about, you know, your unique situation in whatever country you're in. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, and that, sorry, sorry. sorry, Jamie, I was going to say that leads us quite nicely to our next question. Do you want to add your point, though? I think it's... Yeah, I was just going to... I think it's linked to the next yeah. question. But I was just going to ask very briefly where, you know, if you're opening a new school somewhere in the world, where do you get your... Uh, where do you get your inspiration to create policies? You know, how, you know, what sort of bodies do you use? Or would you recommend, Priya? For a school to oh gosh to... me um i think i mean most safeguarding policies you would hope um are going back to the un convention on the rights of the child uh most yeah. safeguard policies say that i think a lot of the time it also depends on what curriculum you're under so if you're a british school obviously you're following keeping children safe um in in education i say obviously maybe it's not so obvious but i also know that kind of lots of um ib cis schools they they also follow uh things like kcsie um mm. but you know you've got to make sure that within i'm just going to touch on like your safeguarding child protection that you have got the local legislation in place um, yeah. because it's all very well having, you know, the UN and the UK, but you've got to also follow the legislation of the country that you're you're living in. Um, so yeah. And that's really important. Obviously, if you're a UN convention country, there will be local child protection law and customs already in place because actually the language is very crossed over. It's very, very similar. Um, but I think, remember when I first got to Thailand, it wasn't very explicit you know, schools had child protection policies, but they didn't really know about the local laws and the local customs. Mm. Um, and actually, that was quite powerful to embed into your system. Um, also, like, you know, when you think in terms of laws, like um, we have GDPR in the UK. Um, in, in China, we have PIPL. Um, I think Thailand, PDPA. But these laws and customs are really, really important because they're about compliance as well. And schools also need to be compliant in their process sort of thing and to make sure that actually they're acting legally in situations too mm. um sort of thing in terms of withholding situations you know it's all about it's quite complex when you think mm. about it once it's already in place and, and you have the advice you know reaching out to the your local embassy the british embassy you know they're very supportive because they have child protection people there that can support the schools as well um but yeah it's a it's, it can be quite complex yeah i can imagine <laughs> yeah absolutely um Hayley, you're going to lead our next question as well. Um, so much child on child abuse continues outside of the school walls and something that we were just touching on previously. Um, how can schools support young people when abuse has originated in school 
and is an issue in school but continues for young people at home I think we've already touched on this a little bit but it's about you know really establishing what are your values as a school and living them so what are we doing all the time to reassure our families to reassure our students that you know we're here for them Mm. what are we doing to educate parents and support parents so that if they notice something that they will come to us and know that we will hold them in a non-judgmental space that we're going to work together to support their child like that's so so important so we're doing a lot of work in in that area you know working with parents we bring them in for dinner discussions um we we bring them in and we're having a book club we have coffee mornings we send out newsletters i've actually put some of the national college wake up resources yeah. into books as well and you know we've even shared like the national college online platforms with them it's like we're in this together for the benefit of your of your child and some of this is really confronting and we don't shy away from it so we do talk to them about self-harm and suicide we talk to them about drugs and eating disorders because this is what's happening mm. and so by creating an environment where everyone feels supported from the parent side and the staff side we're already sort of putting in systems in place if you like for them to reach out to us Mm. the thing is with the students then is just that education and those relationships Mm. who who is an adult that they can go to to be supported by who who do they trust how are we offering opportunities for those relationships to be developed Mm -hmm. we're also training up our students to be mental health first aid trained and also be peer mentors and for Mm -hmm. them to be identified so that students can go to them and they know that we're not we're not going to hold this in confidence and actually they're really good as a student body they know ultimately we need to go and talk to miss wilson now um but they know that that's going to come forward and it's it's definitely um gaining momentum and and developing where the students are supporting one another we also have an online sort of well-being tracker where the students are self-reporting how they're feeling and that's been quite powerful for people to share in their what's going on so it's about giving as many mechanisms as possible for the students to share for themselves how they're feeling whilst also having a really good body of staff who are professionally <clears throat> curious who do deeply care about their students so that we're checking in and monitoring mm-hmm. um and again just really creating that environment so that students they, they they do feel safe we had something the other day actually where there was there was some vandalism right? it was really it wasn't you know child on child abuse or anything but we put it out to our community um and we had a situation where somebody um had upset someone on the mtr in public and again we we put it out to the community and the kids came forward and it's about creating that environment okay school is a safe place to make mistakes yeah. right yeah and so it takes time it's a culture um but it's really 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 important to invest in that mm. really important the kids are faced with so much aren't they mm. Mm. online they they have very structured lives they have minimal free time they have you know where where's the opportunity to just go and free play with multiple kids of multiple ages where do, where does that happen and so we need to be you know just creating as lovely space as possible as we can for them so mm. that they can at somewhere to someone be their authentic selves and tell us how they feel I think being a young person these days is so complex. You know, when you think about, you know, when you're off you work in our line of work and you see the kind of the things that go on and you draw a comparison to when perhaps when we were young mm, yes. and, you know, the, the, the risks that take place um, now compared to what, what mm-hmm. happened and actually what didn't happen back then, you mm-hmm. know, and how they navigate through all this. But I think I, I really um, hear those points there. Um, Sorry, Hayley. And I think that um, building outside partnerships as well in terms of, you know, there's a lot of a lot of um, ownership on the school um, mm-hmm. in problems as well to manage situations. And I think it's really, really important that because there are a lot of agencies and a lot of support services outside of the school too, mm-hmm. um, that I think that we need to engage families in, um, engage children in. We, mm-hmm. we use um, some NGOs here. Um, there's one here called Lifeline in China. But very, very similar to the lifeline that exists in the UK. And it's a confidential counselling um, helpline that outside of school hours that students mm-hmm. can reach out to uh, and, and have a confidential conversation and, you know, and kind of like discuss and talk through a problem. In Thailand, you have Childline Thailand, who are kind of offering that kind of like social services approach to situations. 
So I think, you know, it's really, really important that, that we explore, you know, uh, further avenues as well in, in these situations when, you know, when we're not available. Absolutely. But I do feel as a lot of, in particular, expat families, you know, who are moving, we've got a lot of expat families, they're moving somewhere. They are relying on us to be that connection, right? So yeah, yeah. it's really important that we've got those connections, that we know the people to recommend them to, that we can yeah. be signposting them to those places. But I think a lot of them do look to us for guidance um, yeah. and to be highlighting to the students as well, where are those different places they can go. And that's why child on child becomes so much more difficult in the international scene because of uh, the, the school becomes the center of a community. So yes. something that might happen outside of a school um, comes into school and can create absolute chaos because everyone is part of this like, you know, lovely community. And, you know, it's wonderful to work in international schools where that, that culture of care, as you were describing, has been created and where everyone has that sense of belonging and is really proud to wear whatever uniform will be associated with the school. But, you know, something can happen outside of school that can just, you know, derail a lot of that. So yeah, absolutely. Being able to be the person or the school that can signpost um, parents and, uh, you know, to external resources, like you were saying, because obviously during the holiday season, you know, where do the children go? It doesn't mean, especially with online, it doesn't mean that everything stops because they're no longer in school. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it, we don't do it, but I was listening to Richard Sellers the other day, who is um, the director of pastoral care at Tanglin, and Tanglin have a DSL in the holidays. Yeah, yeah. We're have... even on call in the system of when we're all on call different times. Um, and then a help at Harrow Beijing um, email to reach out to. But um, mm. I think what do we have? Someone asked for the they, they forgot my password to the computer. <laughs> the <glass used. laughs> and also that comes down to uh, you were talking about relationships and the importance of building relationships. And yeah. and for students, they're not necessarily going to go to the counsellor or to the DSL. That might not be the person that in their head is their trusted adult. So whilst, you know, those are really great initiatives to have, it doesn't mean that the students are going to reach out to the DSL because especially if they're a senior member of staff, you know, as wonderful as Pete may be walking down the corridor, <laughs> the, 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 you know, the student <laughs> Bob may be like, I'm not going anywhere near him. So, so you know, it's, it's it, yeah, it's, it's so complex, isn't it? Because we work internationally. We don't have some of the systems that are in place in the UK, so... Yeah, but I love I love the fact that there are those initiatives taking place. Mm. Yeah, some some really interesting um, and sage points I think raised there about the support that can be provided with that messaging of the school, that really supportive mes messaging from the school, <coughs> and that they even then outside of school that they have this kind of community around them. But then the problems of that that community as well. Um, Pete, you're going to lead our next question, which is about um, the resources or support networks that international schools have in place to assist students. Um, what are they and how do they really assist those students who've experienced child on child abuse? Um, I think really it's understanding the, the context sort of, of where you work sort of thing and the challenges that, that are faced within that context, you know, because um, it's not always easy to implement a resource um, sort of thing to a family that, that won't be open to that suggestion sort of thing. So I think you've got to make sure that you've got um, a plethora um, of different areas uh, to go to. So I think, you know, coming from the, the, the China context sort of thing, you know, this is still an area for development in terms of, you know, knowledge and understanding, you know, from, from a children point of view, from a, a, an external community point of view. Um, we, uh, we, we call ourselves an early help school sort of thing. So we, we, we've got a lot of systems in place that, that detect things. And, you know, we hope we're detecting things before they happen. Um, so we base our system around a level of need um, of level one to four um, and all our students in the whole school all have a level of need sort of thing. So we know that um, students who are at number one, they're at universal services. Uh, so we know that they're, that they're thriving and, you know, and all things are, are going well. And um, we know that level two is our early help. So we're putting intervention in for those students. And then when it gets kind of level three and four, you're talking more child protection, uh, pastoral welfare assessment. So we kind of like, um, we form a lot of committees sort of thing. So we have pastoral welfare committees that review that level of need um, in the school. Um, but we also use what's called pulse data. 
Um, uh, Pulse is a platform. It's used for students and it's also used for adults as well. Um, Pulse is um, a platform that's managed by, by currently by TESS, I think, and it's a daily check-in system. Um, and it's very, very straightforward. The questions are very straightforward and, and the students say how they're feeling mm. um, and it generates data for that day that enables to act on that data sort of thing. But also it gives the students the opportunity to look at positive psychology a little bit too um, and kind of say what's going well. So it's not always kind of fishing out, you know, what you think that might be negative. Mm -hmm. You're looking kind of what's going well in the day and they're able to give like commendations to teachers um, who made them feel happy that day. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of stuff. And I think that's really, really important that you, there's a kind of a positive psychology ethos um, as well. It's very important that you have intervention um, for when, when things go, go wrong. But it's, I think it's very, very good to have things that promote positive psychology in the school. Mm -hmm. um, having a robust counselling team, um, I think that's really good. You know, not every school is fortunate to have a team of counsellors. Uh, we have an educational psychologist and a, a team of counsellors here at the school. So we're, we're quite lucky in that sense. But they all work as part of the pastoral and safeguarding team as well. Um, I think uh, Hayley touched on it before in terms of peer mentors um, and that sort of stuff. This is an, um, an area that we're, we're looking at developing in terms of student leadership um, and that sort of stuff. I know that the, uh, someone mentioned before about having a mental health first aid uh, training mm -hmm. for students. I think that's really, really important um, that students have understand kind of the emotional literacy um, behind mental health and well-being. And, and they, they know that when they, they see things that are not right, they, they know the reporting channels and they know that it's OK to come forward. And that school is a safe space mm -hmm. um, to report uh, without prejudice, so to speak. I think one thing that's really, really important that we don't tend, tend to talk about that much, and, and that's well-trained parents. Um, mm. We appointed um, our, our own, our, well, we took um, a challenge this year um, to appoint our own parent DSL um, to bridge that gap between parents and the school and the cultural context. It's very, very easy to come across into another country with your child protection training and your understanding of KC and UK policy and guidance and all that. But if your parents don't understand, and they don't understand your safeguarding model, then you're not going to make the most momentum that, that you want to make and, and the, the, desired, the desired outcomes that are not going to be achievable in the, the time that you want to achieve them. Um, so we found that appointing a, a parent DSL this year, um, it's actually a parent from a psychology background um, who doesn't work on individual cases, but she works on the training side um, in terms of training parents and enabling me to direct the right type of language that parents understand what I'm talking about. You know, it's very easy to have your PowerPoint talking about child on child, but if they don't understand the contextual uh, situations behind that, then you're not really going to get the desired outcome, I think. Mm -hmm. So there's just a few things um, that mm -hmm. I think that we're approaching um, at Harrow Beijing, but I'm sure others can touch on <laughs> a few more. Yeah, just to points. build on that, we've actually, I don't have a parent DSL, but I do have... Um, a member of the safeguarding team who is, uh, you know, a local member of staff. She is one of our Chinese teachers. She's done, uh, I've trained her to the level three safeguarding. Um, we put her through level two counselling skills as well. Mm -hmm. So that where we have cases where that is that cultural barrier, she's coming into the room with us. And mm -hmm. I think that really does ease the family yeah. that we're talking to because, you know, to talk to me, it could be that we need a translator or, you know, there's they, they may feel that there's judgment. So I think that's really important to have yeah. a connection for for that to bridge that cultural gap, because, you know, it, it does exist. And it's important yeah. that we are supportive of our families in that way. And I think that it's something that's really appreciated by those families. I, I'm learning more as a DSL from from that appointment this year. Um, so, you know, you you think you, you know, I think I know some of my stuff, um, but, you know, I'm actually having really important conversations and I'm, I'm posing questions to her by saying, you know, what am I not doing right? Please tell me, please tell me what I'm not doing right. And she's very open and very honest sort of thing. And she goes, well, I'll tell you what, perhaps we should do it like this. And so what, what we've decided now is that when we're putting training materials together, we actually make them together. Mm. So I think so. I'm not just making the PowerPoint and delivering it. We're actually making them together. Um, mm. So I'm finding that quite useful. And then she obviously does the translation. Um, so she will do the speaking. Um, so we've we've done um in the introduction the, the child safeguarding dot com introduction to safeguarding. We've done that with parents now, and then we're going to do with um our parent volunteers. We're going to do um the level one, or our own version of level one safeguarding for parents. 
uh, but she'll be a fundamental part of furthering that process, I think. Yeah. If it's not a silly question, is that parent DSL, are they sort of, are, are they a volunteer or are they actually now an employee of? No, no, they're not an employee. So, so they're still not a voluntary. Involved in safeguarding cases. Yeah. Um, more on the training side and looking at health and safety of the campus and that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, that they're, they're part of our, we have a committee called Friends of Harrow. Um, Friends of Harrow all have individual roles and responsibilities across the school that might link in with curriculum, teaching and learning, that sort of stuff. Um, and this year I wanted to add a, add a, a parent DSL. They, they said they came up with the name DSL, which I thought was actually quite appropriate um, mm-hmm. sort of thing. So it's working well so far, I think. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah, fascinating to learn how you kind of incorporated and really brought parents in in that way, bridging those gaps. Hayley, I really enjoyed what you were saying there as well about that idea of bringing in the, the cultural representative so that parents kind of have that, um, yeah, feel more comfortable in those conversations and there is no judgment and we are addressing some of those cultural differences. And Pete, what you're doing then to really support um, young people with parents as well and bridging that gap um, it's incredible to learn about what you're doing to really support your young people. Um, Pete, you're going to lead our next question also, which is how can um, schools... Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry, we're jumping straight in and, and hammering you with these questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, how can schools collaborate with parents? I'm just kind of touching on this and caregivers to create a cohesive approach to preventing and addressing child on child abuse, um, both within school and, and beyond school. Well, I think it's a continuation of, of our previous question, isn't it? Mm. Sort of thing goes back to what we were talking about before when we were talking about relationships mm. relationships with students well the relationship with the parent is equally as important um I, I found within safeguarding we were talking about local laws and customs um before now it's all very well us coming over as dsl to different countries and, and picking up these laws and then suddenly telling people oh actually you know you can't do this and you can't do that well that's not going to work overnight um that, that's not an implementation strategy that's mm. knowledge and understanding for you as a school um, but I think the implementation of that is a lot different. And I think that's why having like a parent DSL um, is then forming those committees and, and their networks of parents. And I think what's really important as well is that your gates are not closed as a school, that they're very open in terms of collaboration with other schools in the area. Mm. Um, when I first moved to Asia, it was very, very different sort of thing. You know, it was very competitive market and gates were closed. Um, and over time, I've seen that collaboration and networking change. And I think we've got to allow our parents and our teachers to network beyond the school um, sort of thing to develop wider relationships with yeah. other schools sort of thing. So we can get the, the message across in terms of child and child abuse in all areas of safeguarding um, sort of thing. And, and that it's OK to, to reach out and have a conversation with someone from another school. It's OK to check in with the DSL down the road and go, actually, how are you doing it? You know, I'm not sure I'm doing it right sort of thing you know I'm just asking myself those questions a little bit you know that it's okay not to know as well um but I found in terms of collaboration what's really really important is building um those networks of where so that discussion can take place mm. and you know look if you want to bring in your laws and customs you know it, it's actually illegal um to smack children in China yeah that, that's it's, it's not allowed you know mm. um the child protection minors policy is very very clear on that um, but you've got to bring that in slowly with your parents and start discussion groups around it. And then it's easier to implement because then people know about it more in a more explicit way, I would say. Yeah, I, think, I hope I answered the question. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. It was a big question. And I think we have touched on lots of these points before. Hayley, we can add something there as well. Yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, and you're looking at a preventative measure, but, you know, and educating our students. Sometimes your parents can be an incredible resource. You know, mm-hmm. do you have any lawyers who are parents who have worked on cases where there's been, you know, child on child abuse? Getting parents in to talk about their job and their profession and how similar cases have played out in the real world is really powerful. Um, we've done that in the past and again I just think it's really useful and we do this as a school we sort of tap out and find out what our parents do and how can they support our school our parents really want to support our school Mm -hmm. and it can be so powerful when they're coming in and talking to the students you know from the perspective of the law this this is what's happened and this is why this happened and this is what could have done to prevent that I think that's um a really powerful way of working collaboratively with parents because you know yes. the, the law you know is your strength as a dsl 
you know yeah. it, it's what you can throw at very very more but what we call level four situations you know it's what we can throw at those situations is how we, we can escalate it to outside of the school but if that knowledge and understanding is not there and we, we need the parents support on this um, and we need them to know how it's done and why we're doing it and it's not just us coming over with our opinion and perspectives actually this is us trying to advocate the law of the land mm. I think there's another element to it as well. If we take it away from law, if we look at parents as role models or teachers as role models, um, we're role modeling all the time. Um, and, you know, it sounds like everyone around this table work in lovely, positive environments. Um, but, you know, there are schools where those environments aren't great. And, and you know, there is, to use the word toxic, um, environments and where teachers maybe are not happy coming into school parents are picking up on things like that so then mm -hmm. you know it's highly you know not surprising to me that we then have more child on child unkindness um, mm -hmm. happening mm -hmm. so if I look at if we go back to the question about the parents I think it's also about helping them to understand the role modeling that they are doing on a day-to-day -day basis and bringing it back to that belonging of a community that we are all part of a community um mm -hmm. you know so that that kind of you know the whatsapp groups um sometimes those parent whatsapp groups can become really yeah. quite challenging mm -hmm. um you know and and <laughs> if there's an issue they need to come and talk to the school about it as opposed to it all going on the whatsapp group so you know that's we've got the laws yes but it's also about helping all of our stakeholders understand human connection and yeah. human behavior and that our children are learning from us um, as the adults around them um so you know having those open and frank discussions as well and you know coffee mornings are always a great way um of getting parents in because I know like you were saying you know you can do these kind of education forums and you have like 16 star uh, parents turn up and you think oh gosh I've put all of this time and effort into <laughs> this powerpoint there's 16 of them but actually doing like an evening press uh, you know an evening coffee uh, well not wouldn't be coffee morning would it but like an evening um social for parents or having you know your counsellors or your DSLs available like having a surgery kind of every two weeks so you know we've done that before and just so that you're introducing that again it's about that culture of care that we are an open school that we are non-judgmental that we are here if you've got um, things that are worrying you and so you know by the parents having that message that you can, can come in and you can talk to us also then hopefully that message gets filtered down to our students as well like you were saying about come and talk to us. Um, so yes, yeah, so there's lots of different conversations that we can be having in lots of different ways to, to engage our stakeholders. And ultimately, if our parents are engaged, then we're going to have much better outcomes, aren't we? We, we know that. So yeah. Absolutely. Um, Priya, you mentioned there that obviously we're talking to educators here who, who are working in, in um, um, who are working in, in schools where there are really robust and supportive safeguarding systems in place, but there may be schools where potentially that's not happening. That kind of leads us nicely then for Jamie to talk a little bit about the work at the National College and, and what you're doing then um, to support educators through mm -hmm. campaigns such as um, Wake Up Wednesday. Um, so could you explain the inspiration for these campaigns and how they support educators with topics such as child on child abuse? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, the, the hashtag Wake Up Wednesday campaign started um, sort of four or five years ago uh, now, and it's a free offering um, that we, you know, you don't need to be a member to the National College to access. Um, but it started off as guides um, that are downloadable as PDFs. Uh, they can be printed, they can be shared or pushed out to parent devices. Um, and they're suitable for parents, educators, and ultimately also a lot for children. Um, but they were looking at lots of areas of, you know, child on child abuse, um, specifically around online safety, uh, especially. Um, so looking at best practice and risks with social media sites and um, looking at things like influencers and the dangers around what they're promoting to children. Um, things like YouTube and other streaming sites uh, and also gaming, to name uh, a few different ones. Uh, and over the years, they've been very popular uh, to look at and, and to share out. Um, I mean, lots of schools have them on, on websites or they print them out and put them on diff different walls. Um, but actually, one thing we're looking at now is expanding that out, um, out of just online safety and safeguarding into wider well-being. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, like we've been discussing, it's 
really, you know, it's very clear that well-being is such a big factor in this aspect. Um, so we're looking at different guides around, you know, what to do if you're feeling depressed, you know, if you're, you know, got exam stress for this time of year. Um, but we're also looking at other um, well-being areas such as, you know, energy drinks or vaping and, and other aspects. Um, and having those customizable so schools can edit them, you know, slightly for their context. Um, and we suspect those would be very popular um, as well. Um, but as I said, something we've, we've the, the co-founders here are, are offered very early on um, in the National College, uh, to, you know, to kind of give back to anyone and to raise awareness about different topics. Yeah. And I, I think especially before COVID came, you know, on the, the dangers of online safety were probably not talked about anywhere near enough. Mm-hmm. And I think as a world, we're still playing very much catch up on on what there is. And especially if you're looking at the dangers of AI now, AI has no child filters or unless they're in a specific domain so i think there's you know lots more we, we should still be doing yeah yeah absolutely and so important as well that they are editable that those resources mm-hmm. can be kind of changed by educators based on their context i think that that's that's so valuable isn't it that people yeah. are saying you know looking at the local law and what's going on around you that supportive environment you have to consider the cultural context of where you are as well mm. and i think with the national college people recognize our wake up wednesday probably before they recognize the National College logo, which is, you know, a good thing. Um, and hopefully, uh, Hayley and Pete, I, probably over the years, you've, have you been accessing those? Absolutely. <laughs> we used to send them out on Facebook in Cairo. And here, as I said, I've put them in resources for parents to go out and we've put them in lessons. And I think they're just really gratefully received. You know, educators are so busy. And we don't want to reinvent the wheel. You know, the fact that we can just edit here and there is, is incredibly helpful. Um, and, you know, they're not confronting. They, they, they're not judgmental. They're just something that parents can tap into. There's so much information on there that, yeah, very gratefully received. That's good. We had a bit, yeah, with the with the wellness now, definitely around vaping, you know, I mean, the UK is a huge issue with under 16s vaping. Um, mm-hmm. We did get, you know, every so often some of the guys get into kind of the press and a bit more public um, mm-hmm. and a bit more challenging. But I think, you know, all we're doing is raising awareness and around these topics and sharing best practice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for issues that are very real that really, you know, are happening. So we've got to talk about them. Yeah. Exactly. But they come out every Wednesday. And as I said, they're free to access whether you're a member or just mm-hmm. on our mailing list. Uh, thank you. Um, Priya, you're going to lead our, our next question, which is um, what training and professional development opportunities should educators and staff undergo to effectively recognise, respond to and prevent instances of child on child abuse in international school settings? Yeah. So, I mean, but... The obvious one, I suppose, is training staff on signs and symptoms. You know, we've talked about lots of those already. Um, And that's, you know, I'd be saying that as part of our our annual safeguarding um, training, you know, during the kind of inset week at the beginning of the academic year, you know, we must highlight child on child. And, and, uh, you know, in the same way as we go through signs and symptoms of things that may be happening outside um, of school to children, reminding, you know, staff that these are the things to look at. I especially like how we've spoken about the uh, importance of the role of the tutor. You know, the tutor sees a child every single day at the same time of the day, and they are going to notice those nuances, those changes. So, you know, reminding our staff that we're all responsible and that it is sometimes a big jigsaw puzzle um, and they may hold that really, really pertinent piece of information. Um, You've already talked about some resources, but, you you know, for those of us that have worked as DSLs and, and have safeguarding teams about making sure that they are Um, able to access resources, able to access training. Um, You know, there's loads of training providers now out there, but that they are given the time and space to do the training and the reading, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, Having an understanding of things like the Brook um, traffic light tool around, uh, you know, what is Mm -hmm. harmful sexual behavior, what is age appropriate um, behavior. But, you know, having those resources at your fingertips so that you've got something that is driving you. I also think in terms of um, DSLs, you know, I'm looking at Pete and I'm looking at Hayley and I'm thinking their role is not just to be a DSL. I'm sure that they have a thousand different things that they have to do at their schools. Um, And I very much, very strongly believe that, you know, the... The DSLs, safeguarding teams, um, 
in my opinion, are not getting enough support um, in terms of the vicarious trauma that they may be facing. Um, also, that case management um, information from, you know, if we were working in the um, UK, you would have someone at the local authority, you know, your LADO to kind of bounce ideas off. So I think if we're talking about staff training, that's about CPD. Um, and how, having um, our safeguarding leads, having that uh, protected time once a month where they can talk to somebody to talk about how challenging it can be, um, especially in international schools, because, you know, it is a different job in an international <laughs> school to, to be a DSL. Um, and as you know, I've just talked about the traffic light tool, but also, you know, training and understanding what is problematic behaviour. So, you know, there are people like Hackett who talk about what's normal behavior and then it goes through a continuum so that you've got your problematic and then you've got your really abusive behavior um and helping children you know especially our teenagers there's there's more and more being spoken about toxic relationships coercive relationships amongst our teenagers mm -hmm. um so helping our our staff that are leading safeguarding to understand you know what constitutes that how are we then delivering training to our students around um, what is a healthy relationship? What isn't a healthy relationship? Um, and our teenagers, you know, unfortunately, and, and and I'm sure both Pete and Haley have had this, you know, I've dealt with teenagers where they have been in a really coercive relationship. And, you know, and they are being, we talk about grooming, but we, we often think that it's, you know, some adult somewhere that's grooming. But, you know, often actually our our teenagers are being groomed by their own peers. Um, and we've talked about exploitation. So, so you know, all of those things in themselves are big training areas for our DSLs to be able and our safeguarding teams to be able to go and get that training and really embed and understand. Because in our day-to-day -day lives, you know, we're, we're running around trying to spin as many plates as possible. Um, but, you know, coming down and remembering all of those things that happen when we have safeguarding referrals, all of those bits of information, and having those, you know, tools at, at our fingertips so that we can do really good assessments. Um, so, yeah, so so I would say that for me, in terms of training of teachers. Yeah. Mm. I think I agree with you there, Priya. You know, when you mentioned that point then about grooming and about peers grooming other peers and that sort of stuff, you know, one, one of my first slides actually is when I delivered child on child abuse training to the staff is, you know, do you know that children can abuse other children? And when, when you make that statement, you almost hear like the, the tumbleweed kind of, you know, roll across the room because mm -hmm. there's, a, there's an air of shock in, in the air because people's minds aren't adjusted to that in terms of their understanding of, of abuse sort mm -hmm. of thing, you know, from, you know, their upbringings or whatever, you know, adults abuse children, children don't abuse other children. So it's a really, it's a really difficult concept to try and make people understand. It's not just one session. It's something that you have to keep revisiting over time. Sort of thing, but that, that's one experience I, I found I've had in the past when I've delivered training. It's that kind of like that shock, you know, and that that silence for a second while while there's a process of, of the language. And I think especially in you know most international schools are K twelve, you know, all the way through. A lot of these children will know each other for you know a long period of time and yeah. spend more time in school than perhaps they do in the UK. So yeah. both of those definitely add to that. And, yeah, and that drip feeding throughout the the year so yeah we, we you know we're very good at doing those insets and safeguarding training at the beginning of the year but you know having that constant drip feeding around safeguarding mm -hmm. so you know in our staff meetings um in our newsletters um sending out quizzes uh to staff you know i i would say that uh one of the things that works really well is having like a monthly um mandatory uh quiz question that goes out to staff you can do it as a google form um because what it does is if you're a member of staff who knows the answer you know the answer great if you don't know the answer you're going to have to go away and find that answer so it means reading your policies but you know it, it's kind of so that we're not saying right safeguarding we're done end of get on with the academic year we have to keep going on and on and, and reminding people um you know and as a dsl that is part of our role isn't it it's that uh, training and dissemination of information so yeah it's not a one-off event mm -hmm. yeah and that it's the responsibility of all teachers you know not just the designated safeguarding lead that we are keeping all teachers informed um so that they're not thinking oh I've done my training and I'm you know that's done I'm just going to get on with teaching now that you know we are consistently kind of reminding teachers that they have this responsibility yeah absolutely 
Um, Jamie, we had a final question we we're going to ask as well to learn a little bit more about the National College. Um, so consistently, in terms of staff understanding, their approach to specific issues and policy is essential for good safeguarding. The National mm. College offer incredibly well resourced and cohesive training professional development opportunities to support educators, to support the young people that they teach. Um, could you give us a quick overview of the type of training that you believe all educators should undertake? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, so in total, um, so on our so our streamed learning platform, and um, we have about one thousand five hundred courses and webinars. And um, so, you know, the usual they're they're available anytime, anywhere, um, on a, on a computer or through our smartphone app. And um, so, it's very flexible in terms of delivery. Um, and often, you know, there'd be times when you might do some of the courses in groups or pairs or whole school, um, and it's very easy to kind of assign and report back on what's been completed. Uh, but I suppose for the purpose of this discussion, where it's most relevant uh, is we have courses around safeguarding, you know, you're a level one for all staff that we think every September or every August, all staff should complete. Um, and then also an advanced DSL course as well at level three uh, equivalent. Um, so we've got safeguarding. Uh, we mirror that with online safety training and cybersecurity. So we've kind of got those paired off. Uh, and then we've also got well-being, which again, as I said, as a pillar, safeguarding online safety, well-being, we see as kind of part of our central training range. Mm. Um, what we've tried to do then as well is, you know, historically, you know, we work with sort of 10,000 UK schools, give or take. Um, but for our international members, what we've done is contextualized those courses for the international sector. So we know it's a different audience, um, although it does use the keeping children safe in education, a lot of that. Um, but we're also looking at things like, you know, what are CIS, you know, saying, what do, you know, COBUS say, what do, you know, different bodies um, have as well. So we try to contextualize it, bring in def different methods and uh, philosophy, essentially, um, and kind of combine that. So it's, uh, you know, a course that no matter where you are in the world, it should be relevant, you know, to your educators and to your school. Mm. Um, but then we also have wider um, webinars as well around safer recruitment, uh, you know, how to deal with safeguarding issues. Um, and also policy uh, support and guidance as well. Um, and through a recent partnership with the school bus, we have access to up-to-date UK policies, um, which some schools like to use as a kind of a starting point. And I know we've discussed earlier, you know, it's essential that you look at your local criterion legislation. Um, but with some schools, we find it's a starting point and something to go for if you're a new school or new to, you know, creating something, you know, official. Um, the other thing we do, you know, I think it's been, an area that's been mentioned multiple times is looking at parent engagement mm. uh, and so on the national college portal we have a parent portal that goes with that um, so you can invite parents on there to access uh, age-related courses so looking at you know if your child's between the ages of 11 and 14 you know what should you be aware of what are you looking out for and what to do if you have any concerns mm. um, and that's quite widely used as well from our membership base which is nice uh, and that combined with lesson plans around online safety um, it's kind of creating that school-wide, you know, holistic approach where it's, you know, teachers and educators are trained, you know, you've got uh, senior leadership and DSLs, you know, done equivalent training, and then also getting parents in that that topic as well. Um, so, yeah, in a nutshell, that's how, you know, hopefully the National College can support, you know, with that. Um, yeah. Again, Pete, perhaps, or Hayley, if there's anything you would add to what you found useful, mm -hmm. that would be great to hear. I just think it's such a user friendly platform um and i think that the you know, the information there is really relevant you can see that it's been updated um we do use it here for all our, our sort of online training um and we did use it in cairo as well for the national online safety element as well so I just think it's really you know a good platform for international schools especially when when we've talked about context so much where we are may not be offering so much to us um outside of our school to have um a platform and a resource that we can go to which we know is sort of quality assured and that is relied upon by schools across the world within that british framework is you know really reassuring i think we're so lucky as dsls that there is actually there's, a, there's somebody out there taking this initiative and i think someone touched on the point before you know it's a busy job you know this is just one area of the job that we're talking about today, um, but there's a, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a plethora of different arms um, to this, 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 this role and this job, mm. but that someone taking the initiative to make these type of resources that we can use, you know, 
and that, that are great resources. The Wake Up Wednesday stuff is fantastic, mm. um, sort of thing. So you know, yeah, we we're an advocate definitely, um, and you know, at the BSL I advocate it as well. Nice. Yeah. And I always appreciate your LinkedIn sharing of those guides. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I love yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, um, but if, if any if anyone listening is interested, then uh, obviously you can find me on LinkedIn, or I'm sure my details will be somewhere. Yeah. Um, you can always offer free, you know free trials and you know have a go and see what you think, and hopefully you'll you'll like. Yeah, in a rapidly changing world, it's it's brilliant to have um, those really kind of well resourced materials there to go because yeah, it's a busy job, and mm. you know you need you can't be across everything all the time. So I think, you know, Hayley said earlier, it's not about reinventing the wheel. It's about kind of sharing that best practice, isn't it? I was just going to say, is that probably a topic we should go on for an hour and have a time, but I know in the UK, there's talk of renaming DSLs and, and Senkos to, you know, look at, you know, the job is so much wider than just being yeah. you know, the designated safeguarding lead. Yeah. But I'm sure that's something, uh, yeah, people- Especially make... for another day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, thank you to all of our guests and to the National College for facilitating such a valuable discussion. Um, you can learn more about all of our guests underneath here and the National College underneath this um, underneath this video as well. Or if you're listening to this on the podcast, you can find this in the show notes. Um, thank you, everybody, for your time. Um, yeah, it's been such a valuable and rich discussion. Um, and it's, as a teacher who's kind of um, who's taken a step outside the classroom, it's so interesting to hear all of this and what you're doing in your international schools.